Okay, so um, you can hear me, right? Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, hello everybody. Um, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to the talk of uh, one of our most esteemed colleagues in the field of robotics and AI. Professor Wolfram Burgert is here with us today in, in the beautiful um, um, uh, rooms we have here. And we would like to say thanks a lot to the Siemens Foundation, of course, for uh, giving us the opportunity to host um, uh, this talk uh, of, of Wolfram Burgert here. And uh, this is something that has been um, organized by the One Munich Strategy Forum, which I have the pleasure of um, co-leading together with, with uh, Gita Kutunjok from LMU. And uh, it's a great kind of forum where we try to bring together the robotics and AI community in, in Munich and um, have people um, coming from these two different communities and, and you know, come together, exchange, and, and have great people to talk and give an overview about you know, the, the, the research they have been doing. So um, my name is Sami Haradin. Um, for the ones who don't know, I'm, I'm a, a professor at TUM. My field is robotics and, and uh, I always call it systems intelligence because not about AI, it's more about systems, you know, control theory and stuff like that. And um, I'm, uh, I have been um, also able to, to um, intro, um, what do you say that in, 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 in German? Laudatio, right? I was allowed to allow it. It was a big honor when Wolfram Burgert uh, was appointed at uh, TU Nürnberg uh, to hold the Laudatio. But uh, today I will stop here because I think uh, Gitta will give you a very good intro on on uh, Wolfram, who is kind of one of our biggest heroes, I guess, in the world on uh, robotics and AI. Has won basically everything, so it's it's always uh, hard to to intro him. So I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm uh, I was asked to give you a little bit of an overview on uh, the One Munich Strategy Forum, which is something that has been supported by the high tech agenda from the Bavarian state government. So for the ones who don't know, um, we have the big luck that in Bavaria, uh, science and technology is um, important to the uh, um, to the politics. So they actually um, think that it's uh, really important that we. Um, put a lot of emphasis on AI, quantum, space, and so on and so forth. And the high-tech agenda is, is also supporting something uh, together with the two big universities in, in, in Munich, uh, TUM and LMU, which we call uh, One Munich Strategy Forum, correct? I always um, uh, get this wrong. And uh, Jay Suk, you can forward this. Ah, you can do it. Oh, great. So, okay, that's a novelty. So Wolfram Burgert is actually my clicker. That's amazing. <laughs> How do we do that? So uh, can you uh, give me the next slide? This, this needs improvement, this yeah. needs improvement. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was working. It was actually Wolfram, I, it was, I was too late. So, um, ah, this is actually the first slide. So as you will see, um, Wolfram is with us, Gitta is gonna come later, but also uh, Michael Klimke is today with us, who is the head of the Bavarian AI agency. So that's actually an agency which is unique, I think, in, in Germany, that is really sought to be supporting the science and industry network to you know, bring uh, AI not only to science and, and, and industry, but also to the people, build, um, a um, brand, and the brand I think is really, you know, also something that we're very proud of. It's called the Biosphere. So this brand actually kind of connects uh, the AI strategy and the AI players in uh, Bavaria and around. And the AI agency is also, um, you know, I mean, operational since maybe a year now, um, and has been really fantastic and instrumental in pushing the AI, um, let's say, uh, ecosystem in and around uh, Bavaria. So. Um, just to give you a very quick overview um, about the One Munich Strategy Forum. So this is actually a kind of a forum in which Tum and LMU have been you know, collaborating fantastically over, I think, the last centuries, if I'm not uh, informed correctly, before we actually joined uh, in Munich. And the One Munich Strategy Forum is actually a project um, um, that is centered around various topics. And one of them, which um, Gitta and myself are leading, um, is the next generation um, humans and robotics. And this is an initiative in which we kind of uh, also precursored the collaboration among um, you know, people from different uh, fields, such as mathematics, mathematical foundations of AI, robotics, machine learning, um, general perception of AI, but also you know, building systems and so on and so forth, human computer interaction, NLP, and, and other fields. And the idea was really to build this around um, the, the you know, thematic cluster of humans and robotics. And the idea is basically to have robots that are really designed to be around humans to support and, and be designed according to societal needs. So the scientific goals are spanning across uh, various fields, as we can see here. And um, so just to give you a little bit the, the scientific goals, one of them being 
So create intelligent human-centered robots that are, can reliably learn, interact, and evolve. So in both embodiment and, and intelligence, you could say, and cooperation and evolve in the context of healthcare um, and elderly care to address societal health challenges. So some of you might know that we're really developing robots um, that are supposed to help elderly to stay um, within, you know, at home as long as possible to, to be, uh, really be assisted by robots in everyday environments. That's one thing where we're kind of combining forces and trying to build trustworthy robotic systems that are able to interact, uh, support and learn in a um, transparent and, and safe manner. So um, then the key technologies that we are kind of developing there are threefold. So one obviously being the cybernetic body. So we want to develop robots that are not only able to act and move in the world, but also to interact, meaning physically interact, multimodally interact, especially now with the breakthroughs in AI, we see the recent, um, let's say, year or so, in at least translating into, into everyday environments. I think it's clear that the bridging between the physical body and, and the natural human-machine interaction really can be seen as a, as a big challenge, and we really want to build the systems in prosthetics, but also autonomous robots that can you know, serve as, as science platforms for, for the entire group. Then we're also building robotic healthcare twins. So uh, maybe digital twin is something that m some of you know. So the idea is essentially to seamlessly transit between the digital and the physical world. And this is something where we kind of build what we call uh, robotic avatars as teleoperated systems. So this kind of transits from basically being a remote tool, possibly over thousands of kilometers, or being a kind of symbiotic extension of your own body. So one thing that you would, for example, love to build, or that we as a group wants to, want to develop, is a symbiotic prosthesis that basically is not operated as a tool, but really as a complement to the um, long uh, gone um, <coughs> kind of skills that maybe people with, with uh, amputations have and uh, so the system is basically being empowered by AI to, without any uh, delay, to be able to complement the, the residual motion that is still existent. So, and then last but not least, this is something that is right, I think with the COVID pandemic it became more important than ever before, but we see the idea of knowledge uh, discovery or, or acceleration of science, we call this the large acceleration. So intelligent lab helpers, so I'm not sure who knows who knows Tony Stark? So Iron Man, anyone is aware of Iron Man? Who does not know Iron Man? Yeah, I, really? Oh, I thought that's a kind of, okay. So you guys tell them then, uh, you translate later on in the, in the, uh, after the talk. So uh, we're kind of trying to build Jarvis. So for the ones who do not know, who is Jarvis? Okay, so Jarvis is the AI that supports Tony Stark in building his suit. So it's kind of this augmentation and accelerator to, and later on to actually uh, invent time travel. So Jarvis is kind of the super AI that is supporting. And we're kind of doing baby steps in this term. So the idea is basically to build intelligent lab helpers that accelerate scientific discovery in, um, in laboratory environments. So for example, for drug discovery or new materials or even the synthesis of nano and micro robotics. So that's something that we're kind of, you know, building a group together and that's the, the big missions of, of what we see here. All right, so maybe just, I think this is the last slide, if I'm not mistaken, the, the faces, the people, obviously the most important ones. And here you can see all the many faces uh, ranging from electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, social sciences, ethics, um, healthcare robotics, and so on and so forth. So obviously, um, many of them uh, today probably not being able to join. We all had a kind of our trouble to come here. Um, all of us took like three or four times longer as usual. But the great thing is that we can really bridge um, across various disciplines, also involving, for example, communication uh, uh, science, which is also something that is extremely interesting um, in the fields we're looking at. And then also I would like to say thank you for the coordination team. So you can see here the three um, who are, maybe you stand up, where, where, where? I cannot see you. So thanks a lot for coordinating that. That's a really fantastic job so far. So, uh, and this, I think, is the last thing I wanted to, to kind of uh, mention and now I would actually just uh, like to hand over I think to, to you Michael right to uh, introduce also the Bavarian AI network and um, give a little bit of overview there right thank you very much thank you should we try with the I will do it the second I think but it's not enough. if you really do it yeah so yeah he hello also from my side Michael Klimke my name I'm uh, the uh, Managing Director of Biosphere, the Bavarian AI Agency, and uh, so, can we see the next slide, or it's probably, it's not working, yeah? Okay. Ah, yeah. So, so what, is, what is the biosphere? Maybe this is the uh, first learning for you today. Uh, biosphere, it's a, it's a very special name. Uh, it was actually given to us by the Prime Minister Söder. 
uh, and it stands for AI in Bavaria. And no matter where you are, what you do, whether you're in politics or in science or in research and development or in the application field, when you deal with AI, then Biosphere is the brand for you. And as you know, a brand is always as strong as its members. So when we are all Biosphere, then we will be stronger together. This is the Biosphere. The uh, task of the AI agency or Biosphere agency is to promote this network, to make it visible and to also create more and more uh, interaction in the network and the Biosphere Council, the Bayerische KI Rat, where Sami Hadadin is the head, uh, their task is to advise the state government on all kind of uh, AI issues. And together we make the network run and it's a strong network. Maybe this is also something for you who do not know how strong the AI research network in Bavaria is. It's more than 900 professors who are in AI. There were additional 112 professors through the high-tech agenda. Many come from abroad, many women also in there. And if you look at the publication record, then you see Germany being number two in Europe after UK. And if Bavaria was a state, a country of its own, then it would rank number four in Europe after Switzerland and before the Netherlands. Of course, um, United States and Asian countries are much ahead, but I think this is a very strong uh, a record of, of the researchers in Bavaria. There's a, a lot of grad students in the STEM fields, also number one in Germany, the, the uh, Bavaria, uh, and uh, also Munich is Munich and uh, also Nuremberg uh, and North Bavaria are the number one place in Germany for students who are interested in STEM fields uh, to come. I think this is something to be proud, proud of and to, to build on. Uh, the same picture uh, is there when you look at the uh, field of innovation. There's been more than 300 startups in AI uh, since 2009. Uh, Munich has actually surpassed Berlin, not only in terms of numbers of startups, but also when it comes to venture capital raised. Um, as you can see, many of the deep tech uh, founders are actually based in Bavaria, and there are quite some alumni of TUM and also LMU who have raised uh, a lot of money and uh, even 13 unicorns uh, have uh, originated in Bavaria so far. Celonis being uh, one of the largest and the other ones are smaller. The, the size of the bubble represents the money they have raised so far. So a very strong field and uh, I think I'm not telling you anything new about robotics, but robotics is also very strong here in this place with excellent people, excellent talents, many researchers coming here. And if you look at the uh, uh, ranking, um, uh, the AI ranking, you see that Munich uh, has actually climbed to number two in the world when it comes to uh, publications. So very, very strong network and it's also interesting people that come here. This was the Bavarian AI conference, the first of its kind in spring uh, this year in the Deutsche Museum. Uh, it's not only the politicians that came, also Wolfram Burgard came uh, and uh, we had uh, all the, the newly appointed professors in Bavaria and we had Mark Rabert from Boston Dynamics. So this was really a, a tremendous event, a big exchange, and we want to repeat that in uh, autumn next year, actually, uh, because many people ask us uh, when we will have it again, and we do not know yet the date, but we will keep you updated. Um, also, people who are visiting Munich, they are really uh, 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 big shots. Uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber, Jan Lecan, who has been here, and also Wolfram Burgard. So this having said, I uh, again would like to welcome you here. Any questions about Biosphere, any ideas how to create further this network, please uh, come to me and my colleague Leon Breuer, who is sitting in the back, and uh, I wish you all, I wish all of us a great meeting and uh, an interesting presentation by Wolfram Burgard. Thank you. Yeah, also welcome from my side. So it's now my great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker for today, Wolfram Burgard. Um, Wolfram started his career in Bonn. He got his PhD from Bonn in 1991. Then he spent some time also at Carnegie Mellon and then got his first professorship in Freiburg in 1999. 
where he stayed for a long time. And since one year, we have the honor and pleasure to have him here in Bavaria at the new Technical University of Bavaria, the TU Nuremberg, where he now has a so-called Bayerische Spitzenprofessur. Wolfram is internationally highly known, one of the top leaders <coughs> in robotics and also artificial intelligence, <coughs> very well known, for instance, for his work for um, in autonomous mobile systems, mobile robots. Um, what fascinates me most about his research is that he builds his research really on, on deep mathematics up to concrete applications, and I think this range is very unique. Um, and also what, I mean, what, what he does is he embraces novel developments, immediately integrates it in his research, for instance, foundation models. I mean, really cool, cool work in that direction. So in that sense, um, I think this shows uh, the ability of one of the true leaders in, in robotics. And rightfully so, he has numerous awards. I mean, many more than I can name here. I mean, you see it's a long list, so don't worry. I, I won't read all. So, for instance, I mean, he got um, an, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm um, Leibniz Prize in 2009. He got an ERC Advanced Grant. He has numerous Best Papers Awards. He also got um, the ICRA 2020 Milestone Award. I already said he has uh, the Distinguished Professorship. He's also an IEEE Fellow. Uh, so let me see that I can turn this page so that I don't forget get anything. Um, yeah, so he's also a member of the um, Academic Akademie der Wissenschaften Leopoldina. He's also a member of the Heidelberger Akademie der Wissenschaften and so on and so on. He was also a spokesperson for one excellence cluster for a long time when he was in Freiburg. He also was the president of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society and so on and so on. I mean, he's really engaged and I think highly regarded. I mean, if you look at his publication list, over 400 publications and also two books, which are uh, extremely well known. I mean, the latest book was Prob Probabilistic Robotics, I think. So uh, I think we can be extremely happy to have him here as our distinguished speaker for our first, let's say, event of this one Munich Strategy Forum. And so let me say, on a personal side, I now know Wolfram since <clears throat> one year, and I can attest that he is not only a brilliant scientist, but also a, a great colleague and also an amazing speaker. So I think we are really looking forward here to a great lecture. And um, so with this, I would like to welcome you again, Wolfram. The stage is yours. Yes. Oh my goodness, the bar is high now. Uh, let's see, I need to start one piece of software, I guess, in order to operate my cursor here, and then, uh, yeah, give me one second. I think that's the one that's lacking. Okay. Let me see so where that goes. If not, then I will do it manually. If, ah, it's here. Here we go. Good. So, thanks. Um, First of all, thank you for the invitation and this wonderful introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and, and give, this, give this talk. And um, I must say, um, I got to learn Munich way more than I knew it before. And it has deeply impressed me, not only Munich, but also Bavaria. So, so I mean, I've been to many states already, North Rhine-Westphalia, Baden-Württemberg and now Bavaria, and I recently told uh, Mr. Blumer, our Minister for Science, that there's actually, we have this German saying, there's a different wind here in, in Bavaria. It's actually uh, much more accelerated than in, uh, in other states. So um, be happy to be here, right? So uh, it's actually really great to being here and having great colleagues and uh, starting cool joint research endeavors here together. So that's uh, a pleasure uh, for me, and thanks again for having me here as well. Today I'm going to talk uh, about kind of like the, the history, so where I'm coming from, things that we have been doing over the past years, and uh, my attempts uh, to basically connect these things, and uh, also at the end give a little bit of an outlook about uh, where we are going right now, which makes it even harder to connect all these things. So I actually want to also like engage you in this discussion like how successful components of, of robotic systems, like, for example, um, probabilistic robotics, right, can be combined with this, these new hypes that we are seeing right now. 
like deep learning, for example, or in the end, also foundation models, right? How, how can we take the best of all these worlds in, uh, in order to build robust robotic systems that we all envision and that Sami also mentioned in his presentation? Uh, so in the end, what we are interested in is building intelligent systems that perceive the environment and uh, act in them and uh, create these actions in a way that they reach that what we say rational or optimal behavior. That's basically that what we are interested in. Uh, and um, the key question then is always like, since there's no such thing as a perfect sensor, right? how can we make sense of these potentially erroneous measurements that we perceive and how it can we act even in the case that the actions carried out by the system are not necessarily correct. Right? So they're not the ones that we basically give to the system. If you think about a, a car and if you tell the car move one meter ahead, then it never happens. Right? So it might be that the car just moves 99 centimeters if you're lucky and if, it's, if there's ice or snow then it might not move at all. And uh, what we need to be able to do is basically build control systems that are able to still operate these systems in a way that there's meaningful and rational and ideally optimal behavior coming out of them. And um, if you think about this sense-act cycle, as it is called, which is an approximation of that what actually happens in, in human beings, right? so it's kind of like an ideal um, system uh, or ideal model. But, um, in robotics, it's commonly used to actually build such robot control systems. And this is a typical uh, architecture of a robot control system for a self-driving car. So, so usually you do have this vehicle over there right, which, with plenty of sensors, in this case in the roof, and some also in the, uh, in the chassis like uh, radars over here or ultrasounds or lidars, things like sensors that you typically find in these vehicles. And, uh, then the task typically is, or there's one module that is called the interpretation module that basically gets all the sensor data and tries to make sense out of them, in a, like looking at the individual sensor data or maybe even fusion um, approaches. And then there's other approaches that basically try to figure out what the environment looks like. It's a, a model that performs that what we call mapping. Right? So you take the sensor data and the movements of the vehicle and you try to figure out what the world looks like. Then uh, that the outcome of this is typically that what we call a map. It's a representation that we can use for different tasks, like for example for localization. Uh, so in which case we are basically taking the sensor data and the map and try to figure out how the sensor data fit to that what is stored or contained in the map in order to figure out where the vehicle actually is in the environment. And once you can do this, then uh, you can make predictions. For example, if I carry out a specific action, where am I going to end up? Right? If you think about a self-driving car, the task that such a car needs to do is, the first thing is, stay on the road. Right? So, and uh, if you can do this, then you have a pretty safe car already. Right? So uh, and the next task is, like, don't get hit. Right? Prevent any collisions with others. And the third one is, don't hit anything, right? So also try to avoid everything or collide any collisions that can happen, right? And for that, you need to be able to make predictions, right? So what are my actions are going to, what will be the effects of my actions? That is to be one component of prediction. The other one is uh, what are the other pa traffic participants are going to do? Like how is the world going to evolve if I don't do anything? Right? So this is something that uh, you also need to do and for that, a map, for example, is also pretty useful if you think about an intersection or pedestrian crossing and there's a person standing next to the pedestrian crossing, right? there's a higher likelihood that this person is going to cross the street than when uh, there's no pedestrian crossing. Right? And that this, this ability then gets into the planner, that plans the next actions, also a non-trivial task, in particularly because it is not only about motion planning, it's also about, it also has discrete components. Right? So it's this, this question of, should I make a lane change or not? These are discrete actions that are then, in the end, converted into continuous actions by the actual maneuver the, the car executes, which is a control component, um, which is also not trivial if you look at weather outside. Right? So if you do want to stay on the road, then you've, in particular when there's ice and snow, you need a different control regime than when there's no such. Uh, slippery conditions. And then you give these commands to the actuators and then you hope that your car, your vehicle will uh, show the intended behavior. Right? So that's basically what we are interested in. And the key 
uh, technique that has been up there for many, many years, right? at least was the most popular space or area, research area in the major robotics conferences, was I, I think that the like, seven or eight like, sessions solely about state estimation and, and SLAM. Right? So that's basically one equation that uh, basically is a probabilistic equation, a probabilistic uh, term over here. It's a belief about the state of the system given all the perceptions and all the actions. So in terms of localization, you could ask yourself, like, where is this vehicle given the map as background information and all the measurements and all the controls? Right? And uh, this is a specific equation that is a recursive Bayesian updating uh, equation that does this in a, in a robust way. There are different ways of performing this exact task, like basically maximizing this, uh, this belief function over here. That's actually optimization type of approaches. But in the end, it all boils down to having this distribution and then um, like making inference on top of this uh, distribution. And you can also use these probabilistic terms for action generation. And if you think about this uh, utility optimization equation over here, which is known from reinforcement learning, for example, then this is exactly using the very same terms, like, so apart from the fact that we swap x prime and x over here, but this is just to entertain your brain to think a little bit more. Right? So, but in the end, it's the very same model uh, in, the, um, in the action model than in the state estimation model. So that's basically the two equations that represent that there's a sub substantial amount of, of math that you need to do in order to make these make robust uh, inferences there. Right. And if you look at the history, and this is my assessment about where we are in, in, in terms of this architecture in, and with respect to this probabilistic approach. Right? If you ask me, like, how good are we when we look at probabilistic approaches to interpretation to understanding the sensor data, then I would give it one thumb up. Right? Maybe five to six years ago, I would have given it more, right? but simply because there has been this deep learning revolution right, that basically wiped away everything that was out there before. Right? So I would say that we are not that good in this, these probabilistic approaches. And when you look at these, the major conferences, like the probabilistic approach in perception is mostly gone, right? When you exclude localization from perception. We'll come to that in a few seconds. Right? So, um, like, mapping, like, we are pretty good at, at building maps. We are not quite there, and I only give it three thumbs up because, yes, the maps that we build are based on the assumption that the world is static, which is never the case, and uh, which is also the problem why we still don't have self-driving car in, in this in this regime that we actually would like to have them, like seeing them basically everywhere. And one of the reasons for this is that uh, the maps are built based on the assumption that the world is static. And uh, the, the fact that it constantly changes, right, takes them or introduces an enormous burden for these companies trying to build self-driving cars. Localization is actually something where I think we are pretty far. And so there's very, very few localization errors that you see and with all these robots on factory floors, transportation robots, and logistics, and so on and so forth, localization is actually not the issue. Right? It's kind of like, uh, yes, we can do. Right? So, yes, we can. Right? Um, so, probabilistic prediction has been like, pretty popular in the past, and it's kind of like also taken over by deep learning approaches. And then, actually, there's not much being done in this planning and control uh, space when it comes to probabilistic representation. So uh, there's a lot of approaches, but uh, I mean, at least in planning, one of the key problems from my perspective is incorporating the outcome, the uncertainties of the system in these, um, in these planning approaches. And we, have, we will have this discussion later on. So I will uh, talk about this at the end as well. Right? So this is where I think we are. And if you want to know where we are with respect to localization, this is an experiment with the, that we did a couple of years ago. We'll see collaboration with, uh, with KUKA um, at that time when they had this mobility uh, um, group in their, in, their, in their company and they were actually trying to build transportation robots and the question there that we had at that point in time was like how accurate are we actually with, with localization and uh, in the past like people used landmarks, we got rid of all these assumptions and just uh, navigated using maps and what you can see here is an experiment where the robot has to repeatedly go to the very same spot. 
Um, so these black dots on the ground are just for the visualization purposes. You see this camera on the, the, on the left hand side of the vehicle that actually points downwards and monitors this black dot over there. The fact that the robot doesn't exactly end up where you would expect it to be is due to the controller of the vehicle, right? because these incremental commands that we gave to the robot in the end, would you please move a millimeter to the left or so, right? were simply not executed by the controller anymore. And uh, so this is why in this paper we distinguish between the localization accuracy and the positioning accuracy. Right? So the vehicle is unable to execute these corrective movements that we needed to do in order to exactly bring it to, to, to the location. Right? So, so with, which basically means that these probabilistic approaches are way more accurate than like, controllers that uh, are built in, into these systems these days. Right? So at, at least at that point in time. And the same happened with larger vehicles like uh, those ones over here. After we did this experiment over here, KUKA actually had to change the controller to make it more, more accurate, the vehicle, right? because we knew that, uh, um, that or the error at that point was simply too high. But the accuracy, so that's why my people there move these uh, wooden uh, walls around that are at the height of the LiDAR scanners or laser scanners uh, in order to simulate a dynamically changing environment. And uh, like in these contexts of like changing environments, the localization accuracy measured with a, um, uh, with a um, no, motion capture system is in the range of two millimeters over here, right? And only slightly increases when you uh, do, um, it, like, go from, from static to dynamic, and the rotational error is uh, below 0 0.02 degrees in this case, right? So, um, which means that you can actually, even for high, highly, high, heavy-duty vehicles, perform highly accurate navigation tasks. Right. And um, the same is true with, with mapping, right? So uh, this question of how to actually build maps, and this is for um, geometric or landmark-based maps. You're basically describing this as that what we call, call a postgraph, uh, where you calculate the, the errors in all the perceptions, and what you're trying to do is you're basically trying to move the positions right, of the vehicle so that the overall error is minimized. Turns out that this error is, is a quadratic form, and that is basically the Gaussian. When you look at the exponent over there, then it, there is this quadratic form as well, which basically means that square distances and probabilities are close together, which basically means that you're by optimizing this error function, you're basically maximizing the, the uh, likelihood. Right? So, and this is what is happening in, uh, in Postgraph Slam, where we are trying to find the most likely map given all the observations. And uh, this can actually has been turned into practical applications, uh, where we actually see real robots working in, in the real world. So, some robots companies are actually using exactly this equation for estimating the trajectory of the vehicle. And this is an application where we are um, with a, with a startup that we created in the, the Freiburg space. There we also have now part of the company in Spain where we're basically building uh, 3D models of, of buildings, which is uh, relevant for real estate and, uh, and also um, like cultural preservation. And this is um, the, a model of the Leaning Tower in Pisa. It's one of the uh, most accurate model that is available right now. So what we do there is we are basically taking a laser scanner right, and take this into the building and we attach the very same scanner to a, to a drone, and then we fly over the building, and this post-graph-based formulation has the advantage that you basically can easily combine those two data sets in order to basically construct a consistent indoor-outdoor model of, uh, of these buildings. And then, like, once you have such a model, you can perform even like virtual fly-throughs or fly-overs and uh, like fly underneath the ground to actually see how much the, the basement is already inclined, and that's what you, you're going to see uh, within a second. And the other data is just reflections from uh, the LiDAR uh, that from the other buildings that, that are in the vicinity of this tower. Right? And, uh, and it's pretty useful for them. You can see when you zoom in and do projections, you can see the spiral staircases inside the tower and so on and so forth, and in a few seconds, you'll be underneath the ground and see uh, basically that you should never build a building on sand. Right? So that's what you can see over there. Right? Um, so 
And that is um, like a model of the uh, Freiburg Cathedral. It's the most accurate model uh, built with the same technology. And uh, so we're using this, basically, we also scanned the, uh, the Stuttgart Stadium because they lost the original construction plans and do not know how much paint they need in order to repaint the, the roof of this building. So they can now use these models for all these kinds of purposes. Um, cities are interested in this as well because uh, they, they want to basically map their cities with this and then figure out as to whether people illegally built additional stories in, on top of buildings or added uh, illegal garages to their, to their houses and things like that. And that is actually the business plan of, uh, of this company. 40 people right now. Uh, so, and, um, so that's actually that what um, these, the SLAM approaches and localization approaches are good for. And this is why... I gave them this kind of like five thumbs up for localization and three for mapping because it's all static. Um, and they play also a major role in automated driving. And this probabilistic approach to localization is actually has been the very beginning, the key enabler for making the first important steps in, in self-driving cars because basically allows you to figure out where the vehicle actually is and prevent the vehicle from staying, uh, from leaving the road. And uh, for doing this, people use maps like that you see on the top here. It's basically pole-like structures, corners of buildings. Um, then they also use uh, lane markings that you can get from LIDARs because of these reflectance values. And then you can basically use a probabilistic approach to estimate uh, where the vehicle is on, on, the, on the road. Uh, and, um, but there's additional maps that are basically needed for, in order to perform autonomous navigation. This is on the bottom left. This is a map that I found on the, on the Waymo webpage. It's basically um, an annotated graph or an annotation of the 3D structure where you can basically see how the individual inter or, or, or lanes go through the intersection, right? So it, basically this is graph indicates for the vehicle the center line of the, of the lane for passing through the intersection. And there's also the very same thing for the left turn. Uh, and uh, then there's additional information about like traffic lights, right, which is particularly difficult to figure out which traffic light is actually relevant for me. Right? When the vehicle stands at, you know, in the US, the traffic light is at the other side of, of the intersection. And then the question always is, like, which traffic light is the one that I need to uh, take care of? Right? And uh, that's extremely difficult. Um, and there's like all kinds of interesting videos that you can see on YouTube where vehicles do make mistakes, in particular like Tesla-like videos, where there's one video where Tesla drives behind a truck with multiple traffic lights on the, on, on the, in the back, and then like it always indicates a red light or whatsoever, right? So it's basically like, um, and this is why they go for annotated maps when, and put the traffic lights into the maps because once you know where you are, yeah, you know, when you have the map, you know exactly where in the video frame the, the traffic light would be. You do a bounding box around this and then figuring out what the status of the traffic light is. It's basically a much easier problem than if I just give you a picture and ask you, are you allowed to go through that intersection or not? And then there's other applications like this one in the bottom right, where people basically, where they basically use, that's, I do not know, I have not, never worked for them, but if I had such a map, I would use this for ground plane removal. Because, uh, I mean, this is basically, um, gives you the ability to subtract all the pixels on, in, in the, on the ground, and so that you can get all the irrelevant objects isolated, right? And all of a sudden, you have an isolated car over there, which makes it much easier to reason about the objects there. And there's other aspects that might be interesting, so for example, vegetation that grows in the summer, right? So that uh, then the, the surface is much higher than in the winter, so you can actually change the, the s uh, remove the surface from, from the, 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 the data also for localization because all of a sudden in summer, your vehicle would think that it hovers over the ground right? because the, the vegetation is higher. Right? So there's all kinds of applications that these maps are useful for. Problems with this is, as I mentioned, the world is not static. Right? The world is basically dynamic and changing. And here on the top, you see a video that uh, my uh, colleague Ryan Eustace recorded in Ann Arbor. There's lots of snow, like, similar to here. Right? And uh, so this is uh, 
And if you think about this, this video that you saw before with the vehicle using all these lane markings for localization, and if there's all of a sudden, like the, everything is covered with water, uh, then uh, there's no way that you can use these features anymore for localization. Right? And uh, there's, I mean, this is one of the, the problems that we actually encounter and why building self-driving cars is, is hard. There's other uh, problems. So if you look at this um, picture, this is just a placeholder for a video that I would like to, or a set of videos that I would like to refer you to. This is uh, YouTube videos from a guy called JJ Ricks. And uh, he lives in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, like he with, it's a gang of people who frequently call um, Waymo cars and um, order them to go to very challenging locations. Eh? So it, there's one video called the impossible parking lot. Parking lots are particularly hard for self-driving vehicles because there you are not like constantly driving. Uh, so it's not like on the road. So it's basically more an obstacle avoidance thing. And then another thing that is particularly difficult for self-driving cars are these cones because they're relatively small and they're hard to see in LiDAR scans and then they have these reflective tapes on them which make them explode. So ha writing a classifier for, I do not know how much money they spend on building classifiers for cones. Right? But this is really, really difficult right? and doing this in a reliable fashion and these guys took the car to the parking lot where there were plenty of cones around there. So the car was basically stuck there but it managed to get out. And, so, so they, and here they took the car to a construction site um, where, so you can see this, if you look at this video, there are two cones on, the, on this road here that construction workers put there. And then um, if, if you go one picture further, so the path planner basically plan, planned the path through, through the two cones for whatsoever reason. Uh, and then the car got stuck there and sat there for 10 minutes on the street. And uh, they had to call, because there's no driver in the car, so they had to call roadside assistance. And then, uh, so it's, and this guy sits there and talks about what's going on around the car. It's really funny. And uh, there's really challenging situations also. One is particularly impressive, it's when the car is in a, at, a, at a shopping mall. So that's a situation where I wouldn't even like to drive, but the car actually manages uh, that situation pretty well. So JJ Riggs, pretty cool. And uh, the problem there is, like, why I bring, I'm bringing this up is that once we rely on these maps and we are unable to basically drive in a reactive fashion directly in response to our sensor data, then uh, we encounter this problem that we are sensitive to the maps. Maps are super expensive to construct, and uh, this is why we currently only see that level four autonomy, which is basically geofenced autonomous driving with self-driving cars. And so we can only afford to build these maps in local spaces, like San Francisco, uh, but uh, we can't see them in the entire world, which is, would be then like level five automation if you basically can drive everywhere. So while these maps and this probabilistic approach is an enabler for um, autonomous navigation and self-driving cars, at the same time, it prevents us from taking the full leap to, to level five. And, uh, and then this question immediately comes up, like, how can we do this? And, and uh, yeah, deep learning, you guess it, right? So, uh, so deep learning is that what came up of the past like eight, nine, 10 years, right? So, uh, which basically shows super impressive results when it comes to sensor data interpretation. Right? So basically understanding the world. And this is why I give it five thumbs up there. Right? There's also people who do localization, and I once had to review a paper on, on localization, and they downloaded a ROS module and said, look here, our localization approach is more accurate than, uh, the, uh, than that what, is the, what this ROS module can do, basically the state of the art, and our Error is around one meter only uh, with LiDAR. Yeah? So that's, I mean, there's a difference, in fact, right? So basically, what I mean is that uh, what I want to say with this is that it's important to do such type of research, but those experiments are actually not really meaningful. Right? In, they're meaningful in the sense that they tell us how far away they are from the probabilistic approach, but uh, saying that this is a state of the art, it's probably not the right thing to do. Right? And uh, if you look at this more carefully, then you can see that uh, right, it seems to be kind of like complementary. Right? At least like in the sensor data interpretation, that's the revolution that we have seen. And then we are basically, I mean, they're also pretty good in prediction. Rakel Utterzan with this entire work on, on bird's eye view prediction technology 
It's actually also very, very impressive. Right? But so the idea there is to the discretion is like how can we actually properly combine those two? Right? And this is one example about semantic segmentation. It's basically a discretion of how can I you know, make sense of my image of the images that I get from the vehicle. And here you see so-called semantic segmentation, where cars are blue, sidewalk is pink, um, pedestrians are red, vegetation is green, and so on and so forth. Right? So this is data that nowadays cars use in order to make, uh, make inferences about where to actually go, and potentially also even where, uh, where the road is and how to stay on the road. Right? And um, so this is a paper that we also, something that we also recently worked on, uh, like this learning of semantics. And this has different flavors, like the, uh, the first one is like, what actually does all this means that I see? Like what are the objects that I see and uh, what is in the, in the world around me, right? And um, so there you can, you can phrase this in different terms. Like one is this question of, what are the, the instances, right? What are the individual objects that I see in my vicinity? Uh, and uh, the other one was, it would be like, what, is, what type of object is this, right? So this, basically, you give this all these, or what type of element is this? So you give this the, the individual voxels or points, a color depending on which class that is. And uh, in the bottom one, you basically ask this, the system, what are the individual instances? And if you, uh, you can guess, right, if you combine the two, then you get that, like, get a different color for every object, basically that you can tell what the individual objects are. Now, in the first case, you only know what pixels are cars, right? And, but that doesn't really help you when you make predictions. If you know which objects or which individual cars they are, you can be much better at making predictions. Uh, so that's called panoptic segmentation. And uh, right, when you say, oh, some people tend to say, oh, all you need to do is uh, just throw AI at the problem and then it gets easy. Right? So that's mostly politicians think, think like that. But it's actually a piece of art to define like an architecture that beats the state of the art in such perception processes. It's, it's a really hard work to come out to introduce these, these architectures that then can actually oh, and, and pipelines that then in the end build a, an approach or result in an approach that uh, is better than that what is the state of the art. Right? And, uh, and you typically evaluate this on different data sets. Uh, here is semantic kitty and new scenes. Uh, and then like, th this is the result for LiDAR. Like, where you basically um, see that all the individual cars have, have different colors. Right? And then uh, here you see this from a moving vehicle uh, in the individual scans, uh, so to say. So you know, coming about our temporal consistency in a second. Uh, this is why in some cases these uh, vehicles have different like colors there as well, simply because we cannot really tell over different scans what the as whether this is the very same car or not. You see this here in. Uh, and like in a better way, right? And at that time, we were actually able to make it to the top of the leaderboard. Right? This is uh, uh, the fate of like, research. We are no longer there, and that's good, right? It's an active topic. Uh, people are better than us right now. Right? And um, the next question is, can we actually establish this temporal consistency? When you look at um, these frame-by-frame -frame panoptic segmentation solutions, then, uh, and combine those with multi-object tracking approaches, then you can, uh, um, achieve that, what is called multi-object panoptic tracking, where you get basically unique IDs over like different frames of your perceptions, right? which basically means that uh, you now can make better individual predictions. Right? So basically because you can get the velocity or the behavior of that object in the, in the past and use that to make predictions about where it might uh, go to in the future. Right? And uh, yeah, this is um, like the, the, the motivation there, so basically you use semantic segmentation, instance segmentation, um, and tracking in order to arrive at that, what is called multi-object panoptic tracking. Again, like complex architecture, and um, then once you do this, I can evaluate it on uh, existing data sets, and then um, like where, where you end up, and in this case, in several of these uh, the performance indicators, we, we were ranked first at that point in time uh, for LIDAR and vision. And here are some uh, 
qualitative results. You see this minivan over there that flickers, the, that changes color at one point in time. That's, a, that's one of the errors that, that we have uh, in these data. And um, right, so with this, you now can actually, once you have correct assignments over different frames, then you can, in fact, make better predictions about what uh, the world is going to evolve in the next couple of seconds. And there's the same, can do the same then for, um, for LiDAR. And here you see that the colors are actually consistent. Now you can see on the left-hand side that individual scans, like the points in the, indiv or the individual points in the same objects have different color over con consecutive frames, and they stay consistent here on the right-hand side. Uh, so, right, so that's kind of like the, the story, the success story of like, the deep learning approach, right? So all of a sudden we get super nice and uh, accurate results for our perceptions, right, but, or the interpretation, right? And the question is, like, is there a way to basically combine the two? And um, that's something that I've been working on as well in the past. Not enough, to my opinion, and I think the anti-community anti doesn't do this enough because we have seen that like localization and many of these or mapping like are super effective approaches for building such systems. But right now we don't have a proper way of, of combining those two. The reason for this is, right, so here, that we actually, in order to do this, to integrate those two, these deep learning approaches would need to pro provide us with that what is called proper probabilities. Uh, that's uh, what we actually would need, or we call this in principle, calibrated probabilities. Uh, and this is why right, I think there is kind of like uh, that was called, the, I call the deadly virus for this probabilistic robotics approach, uh, which is the ArcMux function, right? So it's basically in the end of all these pipelines, of all these perception pipelines, we have this ArcMux operator that gives us the maximum likelihood interpretation of the data. And then we don't have any uncertainties anymore. Right? It's all gone. Right? And what do you do with it then? Right? There's actually no way to incorporate this with this probabilistic approach. And once you don't have uncertainties anymore, right, then uh, you also cannot incorporate this in planning. Right? You cannot have proper reasoning about, oh, that might be a bicycle or a pedestrian, right? Right? you don't know exactly. In some cases, it's actually also difficult right, to distinguish. So is a person walking a bicycle a bicyclist, or is this a, is this a pedestrian? But it depends on like what the, so there might be a person standing next to a bicycle at a traffic light waiting for the traffic light to turn green. So it's going to turn into a bicyclist in a few second, seconds, when, as soon as the traffic light turns green. And then you need to apply different motion models for these. Right? So having an uncertainty there, a proper one, would help you to actually do better inferences about what to do, uh, or whether, what the world is going to be, and how to basically react to this. So, ArcMux is bad. Right? So, I know that students love to have, uh, have ArcMux in the code. So, that's something. So, but uh, that's why I always tell students if you do have an ArcMux in your code, it's wrong, at least if you are in this probabilistic regime. Right? There's, if you look at the axioms of probability theory and everything that you can derive from this, there's no way to derive, to use a an, an max function or an arc max operator, right? You can do this at the very end, once you have your belief, right? Then you basically, that when you look at, remember this probabilistic approach to action selection, you choose the action that maximizes the future expected reward. That's the only point where this is valid, right? Before that, it's a bug, it's not a feature. Right? And what you actually should do instead of ArcMux is integrate over hidden variables. You can take the talk about this offline. But if you should have an ArcMux in your code, it's wrong. Right? Um, so um, that's uh, so here, for example, it appears in, 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 in these stacks in many places. So for example, when you look at maps, there's this ArcMin, and minus ArcMin is ArcMux. You know, and the reason for this is that we also don't have uncertainty about the maps. Right? This is a major problem with, um, with these architectures because like, we use the maximum likelihood map to make predictions. Right? People in do, who do are working on the planning components, they actually like this because then all of a sudden the entire problem turns out to be just reasoning about your geometry. Right? So you do have a geometric map and then once you have a geometric map, geometries, right, and you want to get the robot from A to B, it's nothing else but geometry. Right? It's super nice, but this is not what we need. We actually need to have uncertainties as well. 
and trying to figure out like what is the world going to be in the future and what are the involved uncertainties and also the risks. Right? So that is one of the problems that I think we urgently need to solve and uh, the same with the interpretation, I will only go over one example. So that's what we need, generating calibrated probabilities and techniques for making use of them, in particular in the planning and no arc max. Okay, so here's one, one paper that I would like to refer to, that's this uncertainty-aware panoptic segmentation, very same approach, but like basically generating uncertainties as well. And uh, I will, so this is like what we have seen before, the top row, that's semantic segmentation. And what this approach additionally provides is the uncertainties. What you can see here is that it actually has high uncertainties at the border between different classes, like sidewalk and, uh, and, and road. Like bright means high uncertainty. It basically doesn't know what this individual pixel refers to. If you should have ever done manual labeling about images, right, this is exactly where you spend the most of your time. Right? So is this pixel still sidewalk or is this, is this street? Right? And you have the very same for like these, these vegetation over there. And then you can have the very same thing for instances. And then uh, what this, this provides is like uncertainties at instance borders. Uh, basically, do not know exactly is this like the red or the green car, this pixel that looks brownish there. Uh, and and uh, so once you combine them, you get basically the panoptic uncertainties out of this. Again, a complex um, architecture based on the existing ones. Um, and with this, you get actually nice results, even over like individual videos, right? So you exactly know where the uncertainties are. And I need to admit that um, right now we are not in, in that situation where we can readily apply this in this probabilistic uh, approach. I'm uh, forcing, I'm really working on Chidich to do this, but uh, he is having major trouble with this because actually it turns out that these outputs of these networks are not calibrated probabilities and there needs to be some regularization on top of it to actually make it work in this probabilistic regime. Right? But once we have this, right, then we can actually have more robust approaches for, uh, for robot control and perception in this case. Right? I want to skip over a few things because it's basically a repetition of this. Let me see. Yeah. Come on, mouse. Here we go. So, oh, okay, I can do this as well. Like, Okay, the, the next question I would like to come up with is this, uh, this question of as to whether we, well, give me say, give me, let me go back a few steps. The first thing I wanted to show is, okay, one back. So this question of as to whether we do, really do need models or HD maps, right? So this is something that really worries me, like right? this question, like this problem of, although it's so cool that this work has brought us so far that we now have like these models that allow us to build robust robots. Right? But at the same time, this is also limiting us to go into the into the wild and have robots basically working in, in environments they have never seen before. Right? Or we, we always need to go there first and create a map of this, and then we can build navigation, solve navigation tasks in, in these environments. Right? So that's something that worries me. Like, do we really need models? And um, Right. And this is, um, for example, one aspect that we have been working on recently, this question of, like, let's assume I'm standing in front of an intersection right, as a robot. Right? So as a human, we are kind of good in predicting about where we need to go and where the corresponding traffic light is. And uh, the question is, like, why can't we do this with robots? Right? And uh, it turns out that if we are able, if we should be able to do this in a robust fashion, then we do not need all these super expensive map operations teams that work at these companies like Waymo and spend their lives with like, putting traffic lights at the right spot in 3D. Right? So they're basically sitting in front of these maps and adjusting the positions of these traffic lights in these 3D environments in order to have them at the right spot when the vehicle arrives there. Right? So it's one of the tasks that they need to do. Right? So, and, uh, Question and also like doing creating these these intersection graphs, right? So where does the lane actually go? They use the center graph, the center line of the of the lane. Other companies use the left and right border of the lane, but this is not a static thing. It's actually a dynamic um, 
object, right? So depending on like how your neighbor drives, and I can tell you that many intersec in, 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 interventions in cars actually happen because someone drives through the intersection in a way that doesn't correspond to that what the map operations team thought they would drive through that intersection, right? Because these are basically the rails that determine where the vehicle have to, will go. Right? So, and the question is, like, when we look at an intersection, can we infer the the the, the topology of that intersection? And this is some uh, work that we have been looking into recently. Right? It's a lane graph net that we develop, where you basically look at, in this case, bird's eye view images. Uh, we have recently extended this to satellite images. So you basically show the network a satellite image, and it guesses the graph, like how to go through that intersection. Right? And here are a few examples for, um, for straight roads. I hadn't, didn't have at the time to incorporate our latest paper, like with the intersections. That was uh, Johan's work about um, the, the more or less straight roads. I always asked him to also include a picture of an intersection, and he refused to do that because he said they are just bad in this case. And, uh, but the latest paper is actually uh, a step towards that and, uh, and to actually infer this from, from labeled data that we got from these map operations teams plus the satellite images that we had. Uh, and um, final question is, like, is there a way to actually maybe use these m more recent foundation models? It might be an intermediate step right, to, to basically perform navigation or to uh, even manipulation. Right? That's something that we have been looking into recently. And uh, I want to show you a few things that we did with foundation models, which actually um, really, uh, so I must say, I, I'm really thrilled by these things. And I do not know where this is going. Right? The, but let's talk about this and uh, briefly show this here, and then you can give me your opinion at the end. Right? So this is a paper that we published last year using visual language maps for robot navigation. Um, that's uh, it's a video, actually, the, um, it's, which will start in a second. So here what we did is we basically um, used um, an open vocabulary uh, vision language model to extract objects from, from images. And we map this onto a 3D voxel map, or these, these categories. Or basically, we put the, um, the embeddings into the, into, into the voxel map. Uh, and with this, uh, once you have this, again, there's a map in the background. And uh, we are actually trying to get rid of this background map. Uh, that's something that we are working on right now. And once you have this, then you can basically tell the robot things that you have been, like, that I always dreamed of, like things like, Go to the uh, go to the chair or move between the chair and uh, the cabinet, um, and then in a few seconds you will see uh, move to the plant. Right? And um, like if you wanted to do this like years ago when there were no foundation models, you actually needed to spend the life of a PhD student writing a classifier for plants, right? and uh, so that the robot could actually reliably approach plants. Right? And uh, now that basically falls from heaven here. The uh, robot all of a sudden has the ability to like move to the move to the plant, right? which is you know, like crazy. Um, you can also use them for for localization, and so that was also something that we. Uh, you, it's a combination of um, ChatGPT and uh, and a um, vision language model, right? Where we're basically trying to. Um, to infer the, the objects, you know, like from a vo given vocabulary, right? Um, to to um, actually infer the objects that are in the image that the robot sees. Uh, and then we ask the large language model, given I see these objects, what type of room is this? Right? And then um, the, we again also we get an like, um, output from the large language model, ChatGPT in that case. Um, and then we use a vision language model, uh, basically, to, to say as to whether what type of room this is. So Rehane had the experience that, that gives a little bit better um, results there. So what I want to show you is like these, that what you can do with this is basically make inferences about visual perceptions that have no pixels in common. Right? Simply because you, the system tells you, oh, this is a, uh, a flip, ch flip chart over there, right? And you see a flip chart in this image as well. So this is likely the very same room or seminar room. Uh, and if you have only, the assumption is you have only one type of these rooms in there. Uh, and then um, also, like you can do this in a, like here in some cases, 
like you see these different chairs over there, and when it sees many chairs, and probably uh, it says that that's more likely a seminar room than, than a kitchen or a bathroom or whatsoever. Right? And uh, with this, we did some uh, experiments on, on navigation. So what is most interesting, yeah, quantitative evaluations, but that what's most interesting are these results that you get with, with this uh, system. So on the top left, you see basically the query image which is obvi obviously a kitchen room, right? And then you show it a completely different view of the very same kitchen in the very bottom on the left, right? And this, this foundation model is basically able to tell, hey, this is a kitchen. As long as it sees a kitchen and uh, if, um, a dishwasher or a sink, it basically tells you, oh, that's, that's a kitchen. Right? And uh, that's what shows the limitations of the previous approaches to image retrieval, which are basically restricted to vision-based features. Right? So, and, and in particular, when you have large viewpoint changes and uh, completely different views of the very same room, then there's no way that you can make a data association there. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so that is an, an, has been pretty interesting. What you can also do in that, uh, people were complaining that you only show this in the ablation study, and it's actually, for me, one of the most interesting results there. You can now look at all the objects that are in, the, in your vocabulary and ask yourself, if I remove this object from the vision language model, right, so it doesn't tell me anymore that it sees this particular object, like how much does my localization accuracy decrease in that context? Right? So and by doing so, you can actually look at the object that is most informative in that particular environment. Right? And in our case, right, it's... Um, Basically, the, the result is that what um, Clip reported as a living wall portrait. It's kind of like this, this greenish thing that is kind of like plants that hang on the wall and uh, make the air better, right? So that's the output of this. That, that's what the vision language model basically tells. That it's the most distinguishable feature for the seminar room, for the seminar room, for example. Right? And uh, so you can basically see that uh, in, the f in this first data set, we had this living wall portrait, and it basically says this is the most important object for localization. So, which basically means that, in principle, can now you go ahead and tell the system, like, on what objects to focus when it comes to navigation in a particular environment. You could basically tell, oh, if you want to navigate in Mirmi, then maybe use Franca robots as landmarks. Right? So that's something that uh, so to actually figure out where you are. Right? Uh, there's too many of them, yeah. <laughs> That's true. But this is actually, so I call this language instructed SLAM. So you can actually tell the robot, for, from my perspective, for the first time, what to focus on when it comes to, to navigation. And um, you can also do this with manipulation. That is some work that Oyer has done. Um, so basically, when you turn, like, like commands like tidy up the workspace, using a large language model with some context that you provided with in a program for, for doing this, given the situation that you see, and uh, that's what you enter as a context, and then um, basically comes up with a program that tells the robot what to do in order to clean up that, uh, that workspace and, and turn off the lights. And, uh, yeah, and then that's something that you can then actually also see where the robot executes these individual commands and puts the things into the drawer and then pushes one of these buttons to, to actually turn off the light. Uh, so it's basically using these language models for programming the robot executing tasks, uh, and, uh, which is kind of uh, interesting. I think that's uh, kind of like a, like a very important step in a point in robotics where you can actually use these, uh, these models for doing so. Um, and here's like our most recent work. Okay, I must say it's one of the coolest things over the past years that we have been doing. It's called uh, language model grasping. So we basically used a, a language and vision language model, so a foundation model, um, for semantic grasping. Right? So the idea was, so it started with me asking ChatGPT this question, I'm standing in front of the desk, there are three blocks in front of me, I need to put, bring them to the next room. Right? And then I got a program from uh, ChatGPT about how to do this. Right? I, I will do this, like I tell you how this continues in, at, after this talk when we are like that. But here we ask this question, I'm a robot, I'm standing in front of a doll on the ground, I need to pick it up, where should I grasp it? The answer from ChatGPT was, 
the legs, the arms, or the torso. Yeah. So, okay, I felt that's interesting, right? So, if we now have the ability, like, to basically segment out these objects, these parts, like, from a from an image, right? And step number one, we know exactly where to grasp, right? But then we also still need to know, like, is it stable to grasp there? And this is what we have been pretty good in, in, in robotics. Remember, we are good at geometry, right? So there's this tool called Graspit, which basically takes a 3D point cloud of an object, and for a two-finger parallel gripper, or you can use different grippers as well, it tells you which points are actually result in stable grasps. Right? So now if you sample, use Graspit to sample stable grasp, and only let those paths that fall into those regions that ChatGPT recommends and you get from like Clip, or in this case Ovid, right, then you get actually basically stable grasps out of, uh, out of the uh, out of semantically adequate grasps right, from these models. And here's an experiment that we did. Oh, that doesn't work anymore. Here we go here. So that's what I explained just a few seconds ago. And then you can have like, very interesting objects and ro the robot grasping like, different objects in a pretty meaningful way. Right? So this is on the top you see grasp it. Just geometry based, huh? and uh, in the bottom is land grasp. Right? So my favorite object is a um, uh, toilet brush. Huh? So we uh, actually asked um, people also about the toilet brush, right? And then uh, so grasp it. Oh, oh, no, um, ChatGPT basically tells you like, yeah, use the handle, right? <laughs> Don't grasp it at the wrong end of the stick. Right? And uh, so this is basically the, the outcome here. It's, it's pretty fascinating, like different uh, objects. And sometimes you have the feeling that the thing actually grasps the idea of what, what is behind this object. Right? Right? So, I mean, it's not just geometry, right? It is basically, this is the, the doll. Right? So the head is actually super exposed and super stable for, for a grasp. But a human would never grasp the doll there. Right? Uh, and uh, this is what you get out of uh, grasp. So there's also, uh, also an example where we do have a cup on a saucer, right? And then grasp it uh, says, okay, oh, and then ChatGPT says, okay, use a saucer, right? And when you give it a cup only, then it says use the handle. Right? Let's come back to the toilet brush. Right? So here's the statistics. Um, and the toilet brush is uh, in the middle. You see this? We even had a question there. We sent it out to 83 people and asked people, where would you grasp this corresponding object? Right? So, and then, you see, if you look at the toilet brush, two out of these 83 people said, I would also grasp it at the wrong end of the stick. Yeah. And, okay, I, I thought about this for a while, and figured out this thing is unused. Right? And as long as you can see that it is not used, it doesn't matter where you touch it. Yeah. So that's how humans grasp. But we are, like, this is crazily high, and it, this is not fake. It just comes out of this, these language models. And I think like, whenever I interact with this and ask ChatGPT, like, I'm a robot, I'm supposed to do that, then I'm always like, amazed about that. I have the feeling that there is some intelligence in there, and this is something that um, yeah, drives me crazy and keeps me sleepless at night. So what is the next big thing that we can do? That brings me to the end. We are in this phase right now where we all believe that deep learning is going to take over. It does it. It takes over more and more tasks, but still this probabilistic regime is still there, and it won't go away for quite a while. Um, in order to integrate both, we actually need to do more, in particular trying to figure out how to do, get proper probabilities right? um, for students. We need solutions without ArcMax, right? so that's the first thing. If you think about your thesis, right, and find an ArcMax, like replace it by a sum and calculate the expectation. Right? So, and then um, foundation models, this is just crazy. And I think uh, we are, and for me, this is we are really at, at an, I could say, like a big change in, in, in time. Right? We are basically able to do way more things than we were able before. If you think about this entire affordance type of reasoning that we have been doing in robotics for many years, right? And this is now blown away with these, uh, with these foundation models. It's just crazy from my perspective. And um, however, we don't get rid of all the problems, right? Foundation models also leave us 
with this question of yeah, how can we actually adapt them, how can we train them, how can we make them better on our own. This is, uh, we are right now all relying mostly on these big companies who are able to train these models. This is, and then uh, we also like, need in the end probabilities because uh, there might be also pro um, perception errors, although the performance is pretty high already, but still I wouldn't use those in self-driving cars uh, for performing the, the, the driving task. That's it. Thank you. Stefan. Very nice talk. Thanks, Wolfram. I have one about probabilities. Um, yeah. So I completely agree, right? So probabilities as the interface between modules and this is really key, but it can also be really difficult. So the example you talked about with semantics, we have a number of categories. It's pretty straightforward how it represent uncertainties. So, you know, we can do it. But how do you think we should go about more complex things, for instance, making predictions about human motion? Now this is, is continuous, it's inherently, I would say, multimodal. So how do we even start with representing that, or should we? So, so what would you think, should we, how yeah, should we tackle I, that? I completely agree with you. I, I didn't want to say this problem is easy and we should have done this <laughs> long ago. They, we haven't done this because it's pretty difficult. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, but still, I think we haven't done enough. I, I think we should invest more into this. And um, I mean, the, the interesting aspect is that once you're able to do better predictions, uh, then you will also be able to build better simulators. Right? So, uh, because a simulator is nothing else but a system that predicts some of what the world is going to do. Right? It simulates the world, and if the simulator is correct, it is able to predict. You give it an initial state, and then you let it run, and it generates something meaningful for you. Right? So that is something like where I think we should invest more and the benefit will be actually pretty high yeah, for this. And uh, I agree with you, it's, it is difficult, but there are tools out there, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. different types of filters and, and things like that. And there's now even like with, with these tools like stable diffusion or so, that, like, there's variants of this that predict movies, right? That they break after a few seconds, right? at least right now, but we are on, on, on a way there to, to basically become better as well. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, so I have a question in, the, in a similar direction also with these probabilities. I guess, uh, first of all, I mean, if you give out a number and that should represent a probability, it's also the question, what does it actually mean? Um, so with uncertainty, maybe I can understand, but giving a probability that you have like a certain object, what, I mean, the first question is what, what does it mean uh, that you give yeah. out a number here? Yeah, I mean, it allows you to, to calculate risks, for example, right? So if, uh, let's assume um, you have the probability that this is an expensive piece of China, right? Then um, that depending on what that score is, you will potentially skip that manipulation task or still do it depending on what the what the value of this element is and and and, and what your probability is right so without probabilities you can't do any meaningful task so that's basically that what we in in ai say if you want to build rational agents and we maximize the future expected outcome which is the probability that we win that match multiplied by the score that we have and averaged over all potential outcomes Okay, but the, the other thing is maybe you can say what your perspective is. So uh, the way I understand it, if you train these deep learning models, you basically, uh, I mean, the training data set usually doesn't have probabil probabilities for the object. So in the end, you train your neural network and then you apply the softmax function in the end and you interpret this as yeah. probabilities, but it, it's not really... Like this is, yeah, as you say, calibrated. Um, yep. So I guess in order to calibrate, maybe you need to get better data, or or is it, or what is your? That's, a, that's a good question. So in, if you think about localization, then you can actually look at the performance of the agent, or it can choose, and you look at any task, right? 
look at the performance of the agent, if you do have the ability to make preferences based on these uncertainties. Right? So, for example, let's assume you have two modalities and your, your software stack provides you with probabilities for both of these modalities. Right? Then the normal way of, of combining those is weighing them inversely by, by the inverses of the uncertainties. Right? So it's what's happening in the Kalman filter. And from that you get an optimal estimate about what that might be. Right? And then you can see, given the performance of the agent, as to whether this is the right approach or not. So in the end, you would need like the correct, let's say, relative probabilities there in order to arrive at the optimal performance of the agent. But uh, I mean, if you think about this, like, more, yeah, I mean, it's probably like invariant with respect to scaling or, or whatsoever. But that I don't know at the moment. But in principle, you need to have like the, the correct relative values there in order to make a, like a proper inference about like fusing, let's say, LiDAR and vision, for example. Yeah. Right, so, for example, if you are in the dark, right, then you would probably pay more attention to the LiDAR than to vision. Right? And if it's raining, also, I don't know, LiDAR is particularly bad at, at rain and things like, or fog, right? but vision is also bad, and maybe you would prefer radar or so. Right? And this, these relative Weights, right? Are that what you would actually expect from 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 your semantic segmentation network or whatsoever, in a proper fashion? Yeah. Well, maybe we can talk more offline. Yeah. Um, yeah, I saw that you assigned both planning and, and control one thumb for both. Uh, deep learning and probabilistic approaches. I was wondering, where do you see the main challenges in these fields or, or in these areas, and what do you think are the most yeah, promising approaches? I think that we have done a pretty bad job in, in, in talking to each other, right, and, uh, and trying to, to, again, there take the best of both worlds, right? In, in control, for example, you have many model-based approaches, uh, and uh, but they have also severe limitations. So, for example, we once, I once worked on, 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 on drifting with, a, with an autonomous car, right? So autonomous drifting. I mean, and the, the other problem is that when you look at the models for drifting, what the most commonly used model there is a bicycle model, right? right? So with infinitely, infinitely thin tires, right? right? That's what is the assumption for, like, that's for which we have like nice differential equations. Right? And, and my thought about this is that we actually should bring these together with, like in, in former years when we were, that we, that we talked about this, like using uh, like incremental approaches or like uh, was this bootstrapping from there, right? Using these, these, differential, these differential equation models and then basically learn the residuals, right? And, uh, learn the cases where these models are wrong right? and in order to perform the optimal action. And I think that, that's something it's where the bo both communities right, have like trouble of, of integrating this and, and, and talking to each other. Right? I think there could, there could be a lot of benefit there as well. Hi, thanks for the great talk. I have a question from an outside perspective. So I wonder how much um, maybe knowledge or priors about scene grammar um, come into play when you talk about perception and segmentation. So for example, I think when we see pictures of bathrooms and we're asked to search for a toothbrush, we would try to find, look. we are faster localizing it when it's near the sink compared to when it's on the yeah. bathtub. And I wonder in which, to which degree maybe knowledge that is learned through our um, development could basically help in your technical applications also to perceive and segment. Yeah. I mean, this is, that relates a little bit to that, what Stefan was saying, right? So, I mean, in fact, we could learn a prior like, about where things are, right? Uh, distributions about where we typically think. But, this normally gets extremely complex because, uh, I mean, for one object it's doable, but when you think about combinations of objects, and this is also the limitations of the entire prediction part, that like, there is this curse of dimensionality. So that 
everything gets like super exponential pretty fast, and that's basically the limitations in there. Um, but still, I agree with you that we do have some meaningful priors that we can use in our everyday life. And uh, right now, I, I would think hey, maybe we should ask ChatGPT, right? Where do I find the toothbrush? And yeah, uh, and yeah, encoding this manually is probably uh, very, very difficult. And uh, but maybe this is now solved, and we don't need those things anymore for for these type of tasks. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the time. I just wanted to ask, with your experience using the foundational models and the large language models, when you do task describe, when you describe tasks and describe multi-step tasks, yeah. do you have a high confidence that you get consistent results over several sessions, or? I'm, I'm looking into decomposition of tasks and yeah. describing them yeah. in a consistent way. I think that is the, one of the major limitations right now. I was told that ChatGPT 4 has built in tools for actually better doing, like having temporal consistency. I, mean, I once saw a presentation from, from a person who actually showed like a maze -like type of task, and then ChatGPT was going crazy with this. You know, it, it was basically unable to get out of the maze. And it, and uh, once someone told me that you can do seven steps approximately, uh, seven is magic number. Uh, uh, yeah, but I agree that's that's a difficult issue. Like towers of Hanoi, that might be. I don't know how good ChatGPT uh, will be when it comes to towers of Hanoi and, and things like this. Uh, so, and yeah, I I agree with you that that's a really difficult problem. Um, but I do not know as to whether we could also potentially decompose things into more simpler steps, right? Um, so maybe it could solve like, okay, do it with two disks. So and then you could maybe have like do this in a way that we compose these individual steps to more complex steps. But I have never looked into this. Would be interesting, actually. That's a good question. the talk, Professor. Um, I had a question about the clip model. Um, so you've tested it on a ground robot. Have you also tested it on a drone with a dis different viewpoint? I need to add something to that because you're asking this. These tools are also pretty sensitive to, um, to background images. And we also figured out also two viewpoint changes. Uh, so that's why in the database that I showed uh, of these opt out the videos with the grasping, the white round background is always whitish. If you put something there, then you can easily confuse these um, these tools. Right? But this is something that um, like we wanted to get rid of, in, in, or we didn't want to discuss, right? And because then you would have to basically sample this in front of all kinds of backgrounds, and uh, yeah. And uh, the very same is also true like when, you, when it comes to viewpoint changes, because uh, m most of the images in the internet are probably like from kind of like frontal view things, where people take pictures with cameras, and not so many from aerial views, uh, so, so that these systems are much better in, in from, for images taken from these perspectives than the other ones. Yeah. Uh, have you seen a find, uh, found any fix for it or <laughs> something? No. We are right now experimenting with uh, something also in the context of navigation, and uh, we figured out that the images that we have are taken from a too much tilted position, so we changed the orientation of the camera to have a little, more, little bit more of a frontal view uh, perspective there. Yeah. But this is also, from my perspective, the limitations of all these foundation models, right? We have no handle to actually tune them, and so you're basically stuck to them. and. Uh, it's, uh, I do not know as to whether this is, uh, or let's, say, let's put it that way, that's the bad thing about these models. Maybe we need robotics foundation models. Yeah, we need to do our own, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for the great talk. I think um, I'm, I'm amazed uh, on the last part because this was really very different from the last talks I saw. So. Congratulations on that. Um, I would like to, to understand your thoughts on what you just said, foundational model or robot foundational models. What do you mean by that? Because when I see 
this idea of basically getting, I mean, I think this is super cool that you can basically get rid of affordances that you hand code anyways. So it's not really a constructive method. So you're basically saying that, you know, we can get these contextual information into grasping pipelines. But, but if you want to bridge to control, then I would love as a control scientist understand what do you mean from your perspective is a robot foundational model and, and how can this kind of be the bridging? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So, I mean, there have been these RT1, RT2, RTX models right now, which are, from my perspective, relatively co close to control, right? So where you basically say, put this apple into the red bowl. So and this model does it without having a classifier for an apple or a bowl or whatsoever. It, it's just like zero shot, right? So no learning. Yeah? And um, in, these are impressive results. But again, you cannot stack these. Like, to, and um, there's also, also limitations. So there's these kind of like simplistic tasks. But like, everyday life is, is way more complex. I don't think that you can actually like put like dishes into a dishwasher with these type of models. And uh, uh, so there's also other things. So for example, uh, you can't tell a robot right now, please leave the room, right? So there's no way that we can turn this into a control. Right? I, at least I don't have an idea how to do this. Right? Uh, but th this, is really, this is really difficult. And uh, I, I do not know what we need for this, but uh, I think it's important to, to look at these foundation models and their capabilities and I think we need to have an effort to understand what do we actually need in, in order to, to build to build a robot based on, on foundation model and have a robot foundation model. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think I very much uh, agree with, with what you're saying. So one, one thing that I would like to, to understand is um, if you say control and you say grasping, um, but then I hear motion only in a way, right? So how do you encode for, I mean, the, the, yeah. the grasping process? What, what is your, no, no, I'm, I know I that you're aware of that. But I what is your thought on that? I'm, I'm sure you have thoughts. I just would I like to understand. I mean, what we would need is actually tons of data, and we actually need to collect all of this and everything that we have, right? And it's not only the, the coordinates and, and the speeds. It's also the forces. It's everything, right? So, And also when we grasp something or the robot grasps something like, we need to understand what, what was the pressure and what happened and, and things like I have no clue how to collect this type of data in order to basically build this. But there, there's interesting results. Like in this RTX paper, what they were showing is that robots are able to transfer uh, or to learn from the data that a completely different robot actually gathered in order to become better in their own task. So it's, it's somewhat able to do this task transfer that that we have always been thinking about uh, this this model, and uh, but we are not there, right? So, and, and I think we should all sit together there and try to figure out what is actually needed. So, can I? Is there, is there more? Because I don't want. I can take it offline. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I really think this is super important what you're saying because you know there is this famous experiment from Johansson in in, in Sweden who has been uh, trying to to show you know with with touch it's always hard to show why it's important with vision it seems to be very simple and he did this very famous experiment where he anesthetized the the the, the finger tips and he's a he's a neuromotor control guy and he was showing that with with this you cannot lighten a match it's amazing this is a very famous video from 2005 mm -hmm. i think and and it's 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 really showing how how force and, and tactile perception are critical in humans so but one, one, one problem I see with this you know, data-driven approach, and I would like to, to see how can we do that. Also, when you look at uh, RTX, it's all motion, right? There is no force data, yeah. essentially. Um, and these are all pick-and-place tasks, and most of them are tabletop. So, so it's, a, it's a lot of restrictions. Yeah. So, but, but, but how do we get these force datas? Because we don't have tactile sensation, do we need to anesthetize everybody and then you know, do the difference? Or how can we get to that? You know, I 100% I, I agree. But how do we get there? How uh, can we I do think that? we should just build robots that do these tasks and then collect the data. And maybe have different types of force sensors, like tactile sensors, and collect yeah. all this stuff. Right? But we need to solve it first. Yeah, we first need to build robots. That's why building robots is also super important and building these, creating these sensors to collect the data. Right? But and how do you collect the data if the robot is not yet able to know the, or to execute the skill? Yeah, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good question. Um, I mean, 
it's also a critique you might have, like when, you, when it comes to ChatGPT or things, these foundation models, this, they are not optimal in the sense of reinforcement learning. Right? They're just able to solve this task. But, but maybe they and can prior. I mean, I, I think you showed, no, no, I'm actually, I'm with you. I think you showed that for, for vision it works, but do you think it could be, maybe we can even substitute tactile data as you do vision data? <laughs> If you have a good idea for doing this, it would be revolutionary. I, yeah, would be interesting. Well, I'm asking you because you're the one with these <laughs> ideas. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. If there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah, and also preparing this event takes a lot of time, so I would like to also thank our organizers for this event.